So today I want to talk about KPIs for marketing and, and why a lot of businesses tend to struggle with doing marketing right as a result. I um, start way back at the beginning, right? I'm gonna start way back at the beginning of the journey for most. Let's let's look at SaaS enterprise tech businesses because that's something I know really well. And most businesses are really lured in by companies that are offering uh, lead gen um, 30 appointments in 30 days, for example. Um, it's a big draw for those businesses because that's exactly what they need in their pipeline. They need those 30 leads and they think that they can get that quick and dirty route. Uh, and I've no doubt that there are lead gen businesses out there that can do those sorts of things. The crucial missing part to all of this is that the businesses need to find a partner that knows their ICP really well. If you just go into looking at lead gen companies in general, they'll generally be very good at transactional business sales. Um, so things that don't have too much of a technical process have quite a short or instant sales process, they'll be quite good at those things because they're quite easy to sell. So you know well what the product is, you've got a good niche in the market, they're reasonably easy to do at scale. Once you start getting into more technical sales, more complex sales, and more niche ICPs, that becomes a lot harder. Um, so I can't count the amount of times um, whilst I was running sales at, at Mojo CX, that we got businesses come to the door promising exactly those sorts of things. Oh, we'll deliver 30 results in 90 days, 30 results in 30 days, meetings booked. You only need to pay us, you know, there's a setup fee and then you just need to pay us for your meetings booked or those sorts of things. And interestingly, those businesses generally always disappeared. We started to flesh out what our ICP was. They just went quiet. They just ghosted us. We'd have the initial meeting. Oh yeah, brilliant. Yeah, this looks like something we can work with. And then nothing because it wasn't their ICP and it's a really tough ICP to get to work with ideal client ICP and everybody gets confused what ICP is. And that's just, I'll, I'll just call it ideal client from here on. So everybody gets confused um, that these businesses then just disappear. And the reason for that is the amount of work that behind the scenes in setting up that sort of um, business, it's not just as simple as just click and run. There's a lot of work needs to do into it. Those guys often work at a loss until they make success and they become quite good at knowing what sits within their comfort zone and what doesn't, that doesn't help the SaaS businesses. SaaS businesses need those leads and quite often when they start out, they don't have the sales team to be able to do that internally. They don't have the sales team experience. They don't have enough bodies in house. And even if they have the experience of somebody at the top who can help support with strategy, quite often they don't have the people that are making up cold calls, cold emails, cold LinkedIn outreach, all those sorts of things done in the right way with an understanding of the industry, with an understanding of the knowledge behind what makes their clients tick or their ideal clients tick. And that's the big mistake is they try then and either bring in internal resources that don't understand the industry and I know that's hard to do with scale in certain industries. Um, or they try and outsource it to businesses who, again, have no understanding of the industry or of the product or the problem. And so they're not bought into it and they can't do the sales justice. There are firms out there who are very good at what they do and they charge accordingly. And that's another problem for, for smaller SaaS businesses that are growing. They don't want to pay those large agency fees or they haven't got the money to pay those large agency fees. And especially when it's a new relationship and they come from nowhere, you know, these guys are asking 15, 20 grand up front to start building a relationship. It's a big commitment for a small firm. Um, and it probably relies on those businesses that are well-funded from VCs or PE firms and things like that, where. You know, it's just a case of let's just spend the money we need to get the customers. Let's just roll with it. Uh, and that becomes less of a risk to those sorts of businesses. The other side of things is um, SaaS businesses also traditionally focus on things being separate. They, they tend to separate out sales and marketing. Um, and the reason 
they do that is because they see it as two functions. It shouldn't be. It's one function with two separate outlooks on things. One's inbound, one's outbound. It's as simple as that. And they should both support each other. Marketing can't do what they do without the knowledge that the sales team provide on their calls. Problem that you've got is the business targets them on completely different metrics. And then that varies wildly depending on the business that you're talking to, right? It could be as simple as they downloaded our PDF. They downloaded our guide from the internet. Uh, they viewed our website. That can be an MQL in some businesses. And I'd argue that that's fair enough to be fair for, for an MQL. That doesn't drive real value for the business. And I'm a big fan of marketing teams being targeted on the quality of the lead they bring through and the conversion rate for those leads. And um, something I see a lot of people starting to talk about on LinkedIn and, and, and elsewhere. And it's definitely the way forward is targeting those teams properly on how well they convert their MQLs into one client. What's the length of the deal? And this is kind of what spurred me on to start Javelin. Um, in, in part, because I've got one foot in sales camp and one foot in marketing camp. I love both. I love the challenge of, of selling. I love trying to understand, get myself into the headspace of the people that I'm selling to and figure out whether it is actually a good sales for them, whether it is beneficial to them, whether there is value in it, whether it's worth to them, the money that the business is asking for. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I love the marketing side of things for a very different reason. Because with sales, you spend all your time outreaching to people, cold emails, cold calls, cold LinkedIn requests, like I said before, or, you know, there's, there's a thousand one different channels now to, to kind of outreach to people. Um, and that can be soul destroyed. If I'm honest, it's a numbers game. You need a volume of those outreach methods to get the results that a business needs to grow. Your proposition needs to be nailed on. Your messaging needs to be nailed on. Your unique proposition, you know, your new, unique selling points need to be nailed on. And your salespeople need to intrinsically understand those, understand the industry and care about it. Really hard to do with scale. You will get the old person that comes in that can absorb that information, do really well with it and excel at what they're doing. But you're still playing a numbers game. You're trying to reach your client at the point where they're in the buying window, when they're ready to buy, when they've looked at products and they're open to consider new products in that consideration phase. They haven't looked in on somebody they've worked with before or some people that they already know about. You've got to catch them just before they're ready to make the decision and close that down from a competitive process to one or two and shortlist it. And you also need to have a method that they care about. Like, so they're going to take your call. Are they going to answer your email? Are they going to read your LinkedIn message? And you've got to be able to catch their attention. You've got to be able to talk to their problems all at the same time, which is a really, really unique and tough skill set. And I think that's why a lot of salespeople fail is because they go into sales lured by the high commission rates. And, you know, the guys that are talking about earning hundreds of thousands of dollars or pounds a year, which is great. If you're really good at sales, you can absolutely do that. But the sad truth is most people are lacking some of that skill set really hard to then be successful in that environment. Um, I did quite well in sales, in fairness. But the reason I did quite well in sales wasn't because of my skills of cold call, because I'm rubbish at cold calling. Don't ask me to cold call. I, I don't like doing it. I've never been trained to do it. Um, cold email generates some results, you know. LinkedIn outreach done the right way. It does generate results. Pips back and people doesn't Stop doing it. Um, I like for, for certain, for certain transactional type software products, it, does, it probably does work. Um, I know people that they claim it works. I haven't seen the results directly, but I've no doubt for some people it probably does work and get the message just right and send it to the right people. I anyway, digress. But the difference, um, that I set Jabbling up to do is that I wanted to flip on its head that content side of things. Salespeople struggle with content. They struggle with running a LinkedIn profile, look, running a social profile whilst being pressured on sales targets. And 
they haven't got time for it. They haven't got time to put into it what they should do. And the only answer that you can give them is you need to make time. And the ideal person to sell for any tech business, any sales business is actually the CEO on the C-suite because they're, they're the guys that have got all the storms. They've got the battle scars, you know, they've been in the, they've been in the, um, the front lines, they've, they've done the jobs that they're trying to help usually, or, you know, even if they haven't worked in the industry that they're trying to help, they understand the technology like no one else does. They've had it validated, they get it, um, they have a real passion for what they do. It's those people that need to be on the front end, that need to be um, being seen on LinkedIn and, and wherever else that the business is active on socials. And to underestimate that, you do that at your own peril because your founders, your CEOs, your chief operating officers, chief strategy officers, revenue officers, all those guys, it is perfect ground for you to get out there share the passion and knowledge that you have around problems being faced by your ideal clients, the industry that they're in, the pressures that are going through, what's happening right now in terms of, you know, how's the economic climate, climate affecting people, all those sorts of things. They're the best people to, to surface that. Salespeople can do it, but they tend to do it at a lower level. So they, you know, people project onto their peers. Very few salespeople can project onto more senior people, um, especially through you know, a video or, or content or long form text or whatever. Whereas somebody who's a CEO, they've already got that step up. They, you know, people collaborate with their peers. A CEO will respond to a CEO or a C-suite will respond to a C-suite much better than a salesperson where it's obvious what their job title is and what their end goal is. Um, I also think that, like that storytelling side of things for senior team is much, much more interesting than it is for a salesperson. I think salespeople should do it, but in the end, end output for a salesperson is they improve their own personal brand, which they can take with them later on, which is great. And they should be doing that. It didn't really help sell the product, help sell them. And so I built Javelin to help extract in a really short amount of time that information, those stories, the, the passion, the enthusiasm that your senior team have in your business and get that across to your ideal clients. And that's hard to do on a, on a weekly basis. You know, your C-suite haven't got time, your founders haven't got time to sit there and record a, a, a video and go through all the questions from market and um, approve things, write their own posts, put them on LinkedIn, make sure it's all scheduled, make sure it's got the right hashtags, all the boring stuff that, that LinkedIn nerds like me know, like your CEO doesn't want to do that. They just want to, they want to be there. They understand the power of social media but they just want to like let you download their brain and then disappear. That's exactly what I want to do. That's exactly what we do do for my clients. A lot of them is we download in a 30 minute interview, right? That's all it takes 30 minutes, just like this, just this sort of conversation. I'm comfortable now sitting in front of the camera for 30, 45 minutes and talking to myself. Um, cause I know what the end goal is. I know what the outputs are. And yet even for me, it's still the last thing that I have time to do. I still push it back and push it back and push it back until I literally have nothing else to do and then I'll record it, even though I know how important it is. And if I think like that, I know you think like that. I know your, your C-suite think like that. And so my goal is to get out of them, their stories, their passion and enthusiasm in as short a time as possible over the course of the month, whether that's 30 minutes a week, an hour every fortnight, um, however you want to do that. Um, remote recording, um, you know, shared, shared conversations and, you know, bang for book. My, my preference for that is to make it a podcast. You might as well, you're already recording it. You might as well make it a podcast. Um, a lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people aren't comfortable podcast. It's, it's kind of a phased approach or it's all, let's start with a fireside interview. Then, then we'll turn it into a podcast later. Um, let's. You know, keep it, keep it at that level and grow it with you. And, and as your confidence and interest and, um, you know, com comfortableness, is that a word? Your comfort with what we're doing increases, then we can do other things. But my thoughts are, if you're already going to be recording it, you might as well maximize what you do with it. Podcast is perfect because people 
you know, everybody picks things up in a different way. Some pick it up through audio, or some people like looking at things visual. Some people prefer to see a person talking. Most people prefer to see, I guess, 73% of people prefer a short video um, to find out about what it is that they're wanting to buy. Well, for a lot of people, they're buying you, you, your business, your personality, the trust that comes with your, your personal brand that is then associated with your business. So do that and then turn that into as much content, good quality content as is physically possible in a short time frame, because there's no point recording something and then having to wait three weeks to get it back, to put it out in your social feed. Cause by then you've missed the boat. You then want to stop doing things in turn. You bring things in internally and you've got to ramp up time. You've got to wait for your team to get, um, you know, the processes right, learn the mistakes, make the mistakes, um, uh, get the right technology in place, combine the technology, figure out how that works. By the time I've done that, you've wasted six months, um, and not gotten any further forward. And I put javelin in as the happy medium between the two to generate good quality content scale. We're not just giving you enough content back for one person to post about across all their social media. I want to give you a note that every member of your team can go into that folder, find an asset to, to post about, whether it's a, a video clip of you talking, whether it's a text quote from you talking, whether it's, um, to use the actual transcript to, to write, you know, as inspiration for a post, whatever they want to do, every member of your team should be able to use that repository and uh, we can help, you know, certain number of time poor leaders at the top who are best placed to sell the product via their profile, we can help them maximize that by, by helping course, write or providing draft posts that they can then authorize on a, on a weekly basis. That for me is the perfect answer. Uh, you're not paying big agency fees. You're not waiting for big agencies to turn the work around and you're not a small number at the bottom of their waiting list. Um, neither are you trying to do that internally. But going back to metrics, what all that does, um, is it changes the way that your future clients, your ideal clients think about you to go back to the lead generation thing. People want results quickly. And the one thing I get asked about regularly when I first start talking to people is, um, this is all great, uh, but I don't want to sink money into this unless I'm going to see results. So what results am I going to see? And my answer is it's twofold. So one, you will see results within the first 90 days, but they're likely to be on the spot conversions because you would be more consistent with posting on your social accounts on a regular basis. Therefore you are more visible. And some people who are already in that buying window will see your post, resonate with what you said and reach out and buy. So that's the initial results that I would say you will see. Underneath that, you've got what I call K2 metrics, which are views, likes, comments, engagements, all those sorts of things. The vanity measures, we all know the vanity measures, but we still insist on measuring people by them. My thoughts are they're relevant, but they're not what defines the business relationship. So they indicate whether what you're doing is resonating. It can help you identify which formats of content, which times uh, of posting, um, what's been said, what types of posts are more relevant for your audience and will help you guide what content you put out. That being said, the people who like comment and engage with your posts are unlikely to be your customers. I've said this loads of times, probably more likely that the people who view your post, but don't actually buy, they don't actually comment or engage are your buyers because they don't want to be pit slapped. They want to come to you when the time's right. That's the natural. You know, that's the natural status quo for those people. And for any of us, I don't want to be pestered when I go into a shop. Maybe it's a British thing. I don't know. I don't want to be pestered when I go into a shop. I don't want someone to help me find what I want to find. I want to find it myself. And if I've got any questions, I'll come and find you and I'll ask. And if it's a big, expensive product, I will go find it, test it, try it, put my hands on it, feel it, pick it up, turn it around, you know, get a feel for it. Then I'll go and ask some questions about it before I make a commitment or I'll have already done a lot of research and I'll ask you some of those questions. We need to mimic that process for your ideal clients. And that's what we're doing through the content is 
we're educating your customers or your future customers about who you are, what you stand for, what your passions are, what, what made you start out in the role that you've started on. And the reason that we do that is that so that when the time is right for your clients to buy, they should be considering you, your top of mind. Even if you're not a big brand, you know, you can be first to the market with a product that red. Some people do it. They make a lot of money. You can be best in the market. Again, it's rare. Some people do it. They make a lot of money. They're very hard to do. What everybody can be is different. That is a lot easier to do than people think. And it doesn't involve you walking around in clown shoes. Right. It just involves you doing the things that nobody else is doing. Looking at the market and thinking, what else could we be doing here to get in front of people that nobody else is doing? And I'll tell you what it is. They're not posting on the LinkedIn profiles. They're not posting on their business profiles. They're not engaging with people naturally. They're not networking with people. They're not creating content that tells people about what they do, what they believe in, and what their system and process is about. They just create content that sells their services and then assume that's it. And yes, that is part of it. You should be doing some of that, but it shouldn't be the whole thing. And this is the mistake that people tend to make is, is they put the sales information out there and expect people to convert straight away. People don't because they need convincing. They need something to build up that crust before they'll come to your door. And that's what we do is we educate people about who are the, the go-to people in your industry. And it's you. It's got to be you. That's why we do it. We want people to consider you when the time is right. But also, we don't want people who are a bad fit coming to your door. That, that's a big difference. And that's something you can easily do with content marketing is you can filter out bad fit before they get there. People who come to you should be reasonably qualified. And it also standardizes a lot of the questions that people then come to you with by the time they do come to you because you've entered the sales conversation further down the line. You know, considerations are all the way up here. They've already started considering you. They've been viewing your, your profile, your videos, your posts. And by the time they reach out to you to talk or you've had a conversation which has resulted in that happening, they're much further down that process and they understand what's left to, to go to. And for me, it's usually thinking around price or something like that. They come to you when they're ready to buy, they have a price in their head. They want to know whether it matches the price that you can give them. And um, so I always give people like a ballpark figure. This is, you know, this is an average of what my clients are paying. I'll put a lot of people off and um, it's not expensive, but it puts a lot of people off who think that we do like Fiverr and Upwork prices. Um, we offer sales solutions, marketing solutions as a service done for you. We know what goes into it. There's a lot of thinking that goes in behind the scenes. There's a lot of technology tied together. There's a lot of process. So people who are a bad fit, who I would then have to go on a 30 minute conversation with, we talk about how great Javelin is, they agree. And then they go like, what's your prices? I tell them the prices, they're disappointed. We're both wasted 30 minutes of our time. It's not a good fit. There's a sort certain level of business where we are a good fit for because it's a choice of, we need this doing, we've got budget for it. And we either go to a big agency or we do it internally. I'm giving them a third option. There's not many businesses. I don't think I've come across any other business that does what we do. Um, or the talk about doing it if they do do it. Um, so we're giving them that third option. I want people to know that we're that third option, come to us, understand the ballpark prices before we even start talking. So that when we do have the conversation, it's a much better qualified conversation. They already know, like, and trust us. And um, they want to buy the service. The sales process then becomes much more condensed. So most people who sign with Javelin, you know, it's, it's two, three week process max, nothing more complex than that. Um, and our conversion rate, because if somebody's coming to you highly qualified, one, they should convert from an MQL. So like call it an inbound lead, an inbound lead, an inquiry should convert to what I would class as a qualified lead much better because they've already got a lot more information to make their com make their judgment from. So if you're a SaaS business, MQL to SQL conversion rate should be much higher. 
your deal cycle should be a lot shorter and your win rate at the end should be a lot higher. Your conversion rate at the end should be a lot higher as a result of your client, your ideal prospects, your leads, whatever you want to call them at whatever point they come to you, they are much better qualified than they ever have been. That's the beauty of content marketing. And if you're a salesperson, if you massively believe in that sales outreach, that, that outbound approach, that's absolutely right. It's part of the mix should be doing it, but accept that it is a numbers game. You're trying to reach through thousands of people. You've got to hit them at the right time in the right way with the right message and the right person, the right personality to get them to respond. And good salespeople will drive results differently out doing that. Absolutely. But for a lot of smaller businesses, a lot of growing SaaS businesses, a lot of growing tech companies, they haven't found those people yet. You know, they've got a couple of SDRs that were doing cold calls day in, day out, day in, day out, and they're, and they're getting some results. All right. You've got marketing team who are putting out great white papers that deliver you a great website. You're getting some inbound leads. That's great. That's two parts of the puzzle. What you really need then is the third part in the middle where cross social, you become the experts, the go-to people for your ideal clients. Word starts to spread. I'm a big fan of, I tell people how we do things. And there's a reason I tell people why we, how we do things. And people are like, you know, Paul, you're mad. Why are you giving away your processes? Why are you telling people how you use Y and Z software? Why are you telling people how you do what you do? And it's simple is if you can already do what we do yourself through my processes, you should absolutely be doing that. You shouldn't be coming to me to be a client of mine because sooner or later you're going to walk away and do it yourself anyway. You won't justify that cost for longer than a couple of months and you'll go away and do it yourself and you should be doing that yourself. And if you try and do what we do and you struggle for time, um, you know, you haven't got the right resources, you try and do that and you get so far with it, but it's not producing the results that you want. It's not consistent enough. You're not getting the volume and it turned around quickly enough. Some weeks you're not missing, you know, you're not, you're not putting content out. Um, then you're probably my client. Come and have a chat. If you try and do what we, if, if you listen to what we say, you know, is the process, the way of doing things and you think to yourself, no, not a chance. I love what the guy's saying and I love the idea behind what he's doing and I want some of that, but I've not got time for that. I haven't got the budget for big agency. I don't want to bring somebody in, you know, risk of bringing an employee in and SaaS business is quite high, especially at the moment. Do you want to bring somebody else in or do you just want somebody who can just jump on it and we can start delivering results in a couple of weeks, right? All we need is like a bit of setup time. Um, that's where we want to sit. So I'll happily sit here and tell you my secrets all day, day in, day out, because if you can do it, you're not my client. If you can't do it and you're interested in the results, then you're my client. SaaS businesses need to think of that, you know, go out there and tell people how they can achieve the same result without your technology, because if they can do it without your technology and they go to the efforts of doing it without your technology, two things will happen. Either they'll carry on doing it without your technology and without the cost attached to it, fair play to them, they're not your clients, or they'll go away and they'll do it. And then realize they're absolutely a massive drain on internal resources, not what they're best at doing, not their focus, not something they're interested in. They'll come back to you and say, right, now we're ready to buy your software. We tried to do it the way you said, thank you for telling us, but actually that's not for us. We want your tech. So consider that when you're creating the content, because your end goal is to turn yourselves into the go to experts for what it is that you're trying to do. Your name should be synonymous with that set of problems um, or that technology or that industry. That's really hard to do without and alone. The other benefit of that is with using the content alongside your market and your SEO or your paid major, all those sorts of things. When your salespeople start to call people, hopefully they've probably already heard of you because they're involved in those circles. You're doing everything else right. When those salespeople ring up, they should be able to say, hi, this is Paul from XYZ company. You've probably seen us on LinkedIn, right? Because we're everywhere. And 
that ICP, that ideal client will go, yeah, yeah, I know exactly who you guys are, CEO, CEO, all over LinkedIn. That becomes a warm conversation then. It's not a, it's not a cold call anymore. It's a warm call. You've contacted somebody who already knows about your business and you can have a much better conversation. Food for thought. Hope that's useful. And we'll see you next week.